Our gospel lesson for this Sunday is found in the book of Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So the apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a little while. For there are many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they went away in the boat and to a secluded place all by themselves. And the people saw them going. Many recognized them and ran there, and together on foot from all the cities, and got there ahead of them. Jesus went ashore, and he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So when they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized Jesus and ran about the entire country and began carrying here and there on their pallets those who were sick to wherever they heard that he was. And whenever he entered into a village or city or countryside, they were laying the sick in a marketplace and imploring him that they just might touch the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were being healed. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless this word today that we might be inspired by your presence. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today for our lesson. It's a continuation or series of lessons that are interconnected. We saw again the other week about Jesus sending his disciples on a mission trip. And then we saw in the midst of that, John the Baptist was executed, and John's apostles, disciples, came and buried his body. And now we have the conclusion of this mission trip. And you notice there's actually a skipping of several verses here between verse 34 and 53. That's actually the story of the feeding of the five to 10,000, which we are going to get in a week's time. But here's the thing. Gee, I want to focus on one aspect of today's lesson. The first thing, the disciples came back, and they were tired from their mission trip. They came back with news of the great results, the healings that they saw took place. And Jesus was thrilled about the work of God that was being done through them. However, the disciples were tired. Okay, I'm tired. Being frank with you. I did film or record these lessons prior to my extended sabbatical. And what is a sabbatical? Well, sabbatical is a time for a pastor to, that, that they are given by uh, the church for a period after a period of 10 years of service in the church to be able to go recharge his or her batteries, so to speak. But... It's not just a quiet time. It's a time of some contemplation and prayer. I'm going to have some fun. I'm also going to be working on the thesis that I've got to get done because we are also supposed to use that time for some study and personal reflection. We need these times, don't we, in our lives? But for Jesus, he never takes a break. So you can imagine for the disciples, this was a really harsh reality. He was inundated by people who needed his help at all times. Wherever he went, he was recognized. He's like a rock star. Everyone wants to get their signature no matter where you go. You can't have a quiet night out with your family, right? This is Jesus. He's a rock star. The disciples were overwhelmed. They're like, good grief, we just came back. We needed a break. All right? But, you know, Jesus. Jesus has a larger perspective. It's in his nature to heal. Now, I will confess, it's not in my nature to heal. I mean, I, I like to see people blessed. Sometimes. There are times I'm overwhelmed. For those who aren't aware, you know, living next door to this church is a difficult thing. I've, act, I've asked other pastors whether or not they go through some of the same things. So those pastors who live in parsonages. And they, most of them were just flabbergasted at the type of people who were pounding on my door all the time, asking for food, asking for help, just needing to talk, whatever the case might be. It happens daily, often and regularly. It's overwhelming. Now, when I'm working and I'm up, I don't mind getting interrupted. It's just one of those things you do. Do, But when it's 10 o'clock at night and I'm trying to put my head down on my sweet little pillow and I'm, 
I'm tired. And I got somebody banging on the door and saying, Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave. I'm like, can you just go away? I'm not Jesus, right? I often come to the door with a bit of an attitude, just being frank, because I'm not Jesus. It is not in my nature to heal. But it is in Jesus. That's who he is. He is the healer of the world. Remember, it just takes somebody to touch the fringe of his garment to be brought an instant physical cure. But you might remember a couple of weeks ago I told you the distinction between a cure and a healing. You can be cured of cancer. And that's a wonderful, amazing miracle. But that's not a healing. Not according to the Gospel writer Mark. Healing is what Jesus really wants to do, which represents something that is a permanent status in our lives. Now here's, interestingly, this word uh, said in verse 56, because this is what I want to focus on. Whenever Jesus entered into villages or cities or countryside, they were laying sick in the marketplace and imploring them that they might touch the fringe of his cloak. All who touched it were being healed. I like this translation. They were healed. They were in the process of being healed. It's very definitive form of this Greek word sozo. And he's not talking about physical cures here. Remember, John distinguishes between physical cures and healing. They might have received a cure, but that was only the beginning of what Jesus really wanted to do with them, which was to heal them. So the phrase being saved is a passive verb that means that Jesus is the source of this salvation. There is nothing that we do about it. It's an imperfect tense. It means it started in the past, but is not yet completed. It might have started with this curing of their bodies, but that curing of the body is not healing. The healing is what Jesus wants to do to us inside. Remember, don't confuse curing with healing, according to Mark. You know, it reminds me of how do we understand this word. Is it reminds me of the story, a little parable, I guess you'd say, of a lifeboat. You know, we're in a boat, and our boat sinks, and a lifeboat comes up and rescues us. We're being saved. Because I'll be frank with you, when I'm in the lifeboat, I'm really grateful for that lifeboat. But until I put my feet on the shore, <clears throat> I'm still in the process of being saved. Because something could happen to that lifeboat too, Right? And then there's going to have to be another lifeboat that comes and rescues me. And until my feet are sweetly on that shore, I am not saved. I'm in the process of being saved. Now, when do we reach a shore in terms of our relationship with God? When do we fully receive salvation and healing? i got news for you. You're going to have to die first. Because until you're dead and Jesus Christ raises us from the dead we will not be completely healed. We are just in the process of being healed. Life and relationship with the God on this side of the kingdom of God is a process. We are in the process of being saved. Salvation is something that happens right now. The cross is that past event, the beginning point of our salvation that ends when we die and are raised to newness of life. Salvation is not a once-and-done event, which is why people say, when were you saved? That's the dumbest question I've ever heard asked. I'm always in the process of being saved. There is no salvation moment. It is a salvation process that begins with Christ's cross and ends with my death and resurrection. And so therefore, for a Christian, every day is a part of that salvation event. And fortunately for us Christians, Jesus is in control of that. Not me, not my confession, not my belief. Sometimes we see even the strongest of people doubt, as we did last week with John the Baptist. But we don't have to panic about our salvation, because the person controlling that boat that rescues us is, wait a minute, wait a minute, Sunday school answer. Who's in control of the boat that rescues us again? Jesus. 
Salvation is a passive verb. I submit to Jesus. He saves me. But it is a process that doesn't end. It's a refining process that uh, it continues throughout my entire life. I'm being saved. Salvation is something done to us, not something that we do. Though we are participants in it, God is the one doing the work. So therefore, I remind you, my, my favorite phrase, one of my favorite theologians, Rudolf Bolpon, was asked one time, when were you saved? He said, 2,000 years ago. And this morning. For you see, for a Christian, every day is a salvation event, a process, a step along the road. And so I'm telling you, don't panic about your salvation. It's in God's care. It's something God is doing for you and to you. And you are living every single day in the process of the salvation of what God wants to do with your life. I hope you find that helpful because, you know, we often say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I blew it again today. Well, okay. It's part of the process of salvation. When you're in the process of salvation, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to take steps backward or to the left or to the right or things that don't advance our relationship with God. It happens. It's part of the process of salvation. Okay? So we don't have to beat ourselves up or whip ourselves. That's what Martin Luther used to do to himself until he understood the grace of God. He felt so guilty about the stray thoughts in his brain and the things that he said and the things that he did or didn't do that he would literally take a whip and beat himself with it. Try to beat himself into submission. We don't have to do that anymore. It's life. Salvation is a process. You're an unfinished product. I mean, think about it. It's like a piece of art that says, I can't believe it. I'm an incomplete product. I, you know, my characters are missing arms. What an ugly painting. It's in the process of being made. Sometimes the artist makes lines uh, going in a direction that they're like, oh, I need to change that shape or that form of that arm. And so they erase that and move it over this way. And then say, oh, that looks silly. And you move it this way. Oh, that looks silly this way. Until they finally get the appropriate form of how those arms are supposed to look and what they would be doing for that character, right? That's what God is doing with you. God is just continually refining us. It's a daily process. So don't, don't feel guilty that you're an unfinished product. Nobody is on this side of the kingdom of heaven. You are set free. Let us give thanks. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that you set us free. Set us free by the salvation that was begun on the cross, by the work that you are doing to us every single day. We are in the process of being saved. We're in your lifeboat. <clears throat> we haven't reached the shore yet. <clears throat> reaching the shore is going <clears> to... <throat> Before reaching the shore, we're going to have to die, I guess. But that's okay. Even that is in your hands. You promise that we will have new life in Jesus. And for that, we give thanks in your precious name.